I am very uh, pleased to be here with um, a colleague of ours, an international, an international academic colleague of mine, um, Assistant Professor Richard Haydarian. Uh, he is an eminent scholar, uh, an expert on um, Philippines political science and also political science, um, the international situation in the, um, in the Western um, Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia region and also the Pacific. Uh, and he's the author of the, uh, an upcoming book on the rise of the new pre um, president, uh, Filipino President uh, Duterte. Thank you for coming. <laughs> um, can I ask you one question? I'm of interest. I'm, I have an interest in uh, Southeast Asia and in particular ASEAN, but I am uh, more from a historical perspective. I'm a historian myself as opposed to being a political scientist. Um, and I'm interested in being the 50th anniversary of ASEAN. ASEAN being created in August 1967 um, and I've written quite extensively about those early years and it's interesting back then that the Philippines back in the 60s the Philippines wasn't considered to be as major as big a player as say Indonesia was back then in the early years of ASEAN Indonesia Malaysia and Singapore and Thailand tended to have more and and the Philippines is an offshore country Whereas, you know, they're all linked apart from the Indonesia, but Indonesia is so close to Malaysia and Singapore. And Malaysia and Singapore, you know, more closely linked to Thailand. Um, yet this is the year that Indonesia, that the Philippines is going to be the, have the presidency of ASEAN. Do you think, I get the feeling that Filipinos have never really valued ASEAN. Would you, would you say that's correct? Well, for a long time, the Philippines was the sole Catholic majority country until East Timor came on board. Uh, so in terms of religion, uh, there is a tremendous amount of difference between Filipinos and the rest of Southeast Asia. But it's not only that. There are other elements. I mean, for a long time, the Philippines has been in the shadow of the United States. It was a sole American colony in this part of the world. It's an, it speaks English, but with a different accent <laughs> than the other former British colonies. Uh, and if you look at the Philippines, in many ways, it's more uh, similar to Latin America countries you know uh, for some time Manila was called the Havana of the East so in many ways the, U uh, the Philippines is more part of the Western Latin Iberian uh, episteme episteme rather than this Asian Hindu Muslim episteme yeah. which has dominated the ASEAN so there's this psychological ideological and geographical difference and then of course as you mentioned correctly the Philippines was while it was among the founders of the ASEAN it was never as much as central as let's say Indonesia it's not only a question of size and, and uh, heft is also about the fact that the Philippines for a long time was more or less a proxy of the United States. The idea of non-aligned movement, uh, w which was espoused by Indonesia and Sukarno, and to a certain degree welcomed by Singapore and other countries, was never really internalized by the Philippines. So while the Philippines paid a lip service to the non-aligned concept and part of the non-aligned movement officially, in terms of actual foreign policy, it was very much an extension of American interests, American thinking, and American military dagger here in the Western Pacific part of the world. And surveys also suggest that the level of consciousness of the Filipinos about ASEAN, the rest of Asia, is tremendously low, even among the more educated Filipinos. I mean, at most they know a little bit about Singapore, a little bit about Japan, or but that's it. Uh, uh, the level of interest in other ASEAN countries is tremendously low, and the level of affiliation is very low. So now the Philippines is taking over the ASEAN chairmanship uh, after 50 years on a rotational basis, contrary to what Duterte supporters say. He was was not elected <laughs> as the chairman of pre uh, and president of ASEAN. Uh, so a lot of propaganda is going on there. But some strange things are happening because for the first time you have a Filipino president. I mean, to be honest, we, have had n we haven't had anyone like him. You know, someone who can cause at the most sacred figures for Filipinos, whether it's the Pope, whether it's the American president, among others, or someone who's from Mindanao, you know, the dark underbelly of the Philippines. I mean, a, a conflict-ridden region that was neglected by the rest of the country. Uh, he's the first person who openly uh, advertises his Islamic and Muslim background through his mother, while most American uh, Filipino politicians tend to uh, either be critical of the Muslim population, Muslim minority, or if they have any background, they try to de-emphasize it. And he and he went he went from mayor to president almost overnight. So in many ways, uh, he is a first. But what makes him really special in terms of the broader regional dynamics is the fact that he is the first Filipino president that has really begun to question where the Philippines 
should really go on its own and get out of the shadow of America. And he has well, done that very with sound and fury. That's really interesting like that, because I've noticed, as you say, the Philippines has always been the American strategic client. Well, it was a former American colony. Right. Um, and of course, strategically, strategically in the Second World War, it's always had the American bases. And, and as you say, with ASEAN and the non-aligned, Indonesia and their non-aligned foreign policy. Although that being said, I think Suharto made good use of an alliance with the American, but you know the fact that there's you know the zone of peace, freedom, and neutrality never worked, and all of that sort of stuff because of the American alliance. And I think I think it's a difficult thing for for future ASEAN relations is that ASEAN was built while it's a regional organisation, it was built on a bedrock of bilateral military alliances. You know the British the the, the Malaysians had the British bases in um, in Malaysia and the Singaporeans also had British bases there. Uh, really, only Indonesia was the only founding country without foreign bases. The Thais had Americans, of course. And and so it's quite interesting that that foundation, that solid you know, foundation of Philippine-American relations has been somewhat tested, isn't it? Right. I mean, this is the strange thing about Duterte. He's both fresh and out of time. He's fresh in the sense that he's the first president and was openly questioned the value of American alliance with the Philippines, whether Americans are reliable. Who are you, are you with us? Are you not with us? Who dares to cuss at their leaders? At the same time, he's quite out of time because sometimes he sounds like Sukarno. Sometimes he sounds like someone is talking like, about. Uh, you're right, actually, a non-aligned right, person exactly. who's 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 trying to court court both sides, which is exactly right. what Sukarno so, did. And, yeah. and, and some would even say that he's calling for an Asia for Asians, like yes. what Japan yes. used to do in yes. early 20th century. Yes. So in some ways he's out of time. In some ways he's very fresh in the Philippine context, and it's that paradox that makes him a tremendously interesting leader. Nonetheless, the fact of the matter is that what makes also Duterte quite influential despite the fact that you know, he comes from a relatively small sized power, is, is first of all his publicity, his media mileage. Uh, the other thing is that he has concentrated power more than most of his predecessors in recent memory, probably since the fall of the Marcos dictatorship. And that concentration of power and the process of authoritarianization in the Philippines, whereby you formally have a democracy, but checks and balances are essentially in hibernation because much of the Senate has defected to him. The Supreme Court is not willing to stand up to him. He has over the top kind of approval ratings of more than 80%. Well, so I was about to say, do you think it's to do with the approval rating that he's, he's feeling bold enough to take on Absolutely. the United States? I think it, it's not only the approval rating, but the kind of fanatic support, the passionate base he has. And this is where there are a lot of similarities between him and Trump, with the exception that Trump enters the office with a very low trust rating and he continues to have the trust rating. Duterte came in as a very polarizing character with a very low trust rating, but once he was in office, he got a 90% trust rating. So overnight, you have much of the Philippine public defecting to him. The same thing with other institutions of the state. So that has given him a carte blanche. That's his mentality, yeah, that this carte blanche. And he was a mayor for two decades and he thinks like a mayor, mm. a mayor who controls almost everything. And then of course there are elements of Hugo Chavez with him. Like Hugo Chavez of Venezuela, he says a lot of anti-American, anti-Western things. But the other thing is his, his appeal to the masses. While the usual America, uh, Filipino politicians were more like Hillary Clinton, you know, scripted speeches, usual slogans, uh, clean, neat, uh, careful about what they say, a lot of them Western educated. Now you have a guy, a guy who's from, not from mainstream Filipino elite, who cracks jokes, who speaks the language of the masses, uh, and it shows no reverence for uh, existing institutions. And more, yeah, so authenticity, that's what he brings to the table. And I think after three decades of fatigue, with corruption in the Philippines, with broken promises, among other things, people felt we have to give a chance to someone new. So I know a lot of people who didn't vote for him, and they're telling me, despite all of the things that happened in the Philippines, which were not uh, you know, in consonance with his promises, uh, a lot of things didn't go right, uh, they're still saying, we want to give this guy a time, a chance, because maybe he's the only guy who can take the Philippines through the Valley of Tears. Because sometimes you may need a strong leader to do that because the previous leader just didn't have what it took. But what do you think his motivations are for? Because of course he's courting the Chinese and he's getting aid out of the Chinese. The Philippines have always got aid out of the Americans. Yeah. Um, what what's in it for him to and the Philippine Filipino people as a general rule have right. tended to be very pro-American right. over the year over the decades. So what's it in it, in it for him to you know to to speak out against the Americans? Right. What do right. you think? 
very quickly, I mean, first of all, he's not, it's not like he's pro-China. His assessment was that the previous Filipino administration was too confrontational towards China without American backing. The Obama administration never clarified whether it will come to the Philippine rescue in an event of conflict with China in the South China Sea. I ask senior officials of America, ha Admiral Harris of the Pacific Command, former number two at the State Department, James Steinberg, they never gave me a clear answer where the MDT, the Mutual Defense Treaty with the Philippines, in any ways could be relevant in an event of conflict. So in a very pragmatic sense, Duterte said, what's the point of us using this arbitration award and risking war and sanctions from China when we don't have a full backing of the Obama administration, which was very reticent in, in standing up to, to the Chinese. And then at the same time, the Chinese offered him heaven. If he changed, yeah, yeah. G well, he shifted well, gear and him. offered him hell if he yeah. didn't. The Chinese made it very clear behind the scenes that if the Philippines continued the policy uh, of the previous administration, now under Duterte, then they could make life very hard for the Philippines in Scarborough, in the Spratlys, among others. And they were telling the Filipinos, do you think the Americans are reliable? Then Duterte felt no. Nonetheless, it doesn't mean that he's defecting from one master to the other. He's simply creating more room for leverage. And one thing that people miss is that the country that actually Duterte likes the most is not China, it's Japan. He's closest to Japan than any other country because Jap Japanese investors are very involved in Davao. He had an excellent relationship with the Japanese consulate there. And now you have Shinzo Abe on a cutting edge level of personalized diplomacy, trying to court the heart of Duterte and matching every renminbi that the Chinese are putting on the table. So if the Chinese offer 25, 24 billion dollars in pledges, the Japanese are actually offering tens of billions of dollars in investments and, over, or, uh, and official development assistance. So the Japanese are going against that. And what Duterte wants is this. If the Americans are more reliable in terms of their military commitments, and if they stop criticizing me on human rights, then I'm willing to repair my ties with America and restore some of the military exercises that I cancel. And if the Japanese offer me more economic assistance, then I don't have to be at the yeah, mercy of the Chinese. So what's happening here is the classic case of small powers playing big powers against each other. It's an equibalancing. Now, is it because Duterte has this kind of unique genius? No, I think some of it was spontaneous and some of it was actually common sense. I mean, if you look at Vietnam, you look at Singapore, you look at Korea, this is something that most small countries have been doing. What's strange is Duterte's predecessors didn't play that game very well. They could have played their card very well, but they didn't. They were too constrained by the pro-American straitjacket. But you have someone like Duterte who was never part of the Western episteme. He had his own world in Davao. He had his tension with America. Some, would, some even say that America rejected his visa in 2002. That's why he has some tensions with them. So he comes in and says, what's common sense for a small country? Play the big powers against each other. And as Machiavelli advised, but small city say. states should not side with one power against each other because they could end up as part of a bargain. That would be provided he maintains his strong level of support because it's interesting when you made those, those links to Sakana and Sakana did the same and that was ultimately his Absolutely. undoing because he lost the support, internal support. And so Duterte has to be very careful. And I think too, this is where some of his domestic policies he's got to be very careful on, which like his war on drugs. And also the, his, his problems with the Muslim minority as well. So he's, he's, he's got to be, while he might be feeling good about, you know, playing off strategic partners with each other. He's just, got to be very, very sure. careful about his internal... Because the um, Philippines, of course, hasn't always had a history of stable government. Yes. And they haven't always had a history of internal the stability. The military is a very important thing. At the end of the day, you can have the highest approval ratings, you can be a, a star in global headlines, or notorious for that matter. But if the military feels that their basic institutional interest is being undermined, then Duterte could be in trouble. That is why Duterte has made it very clear that while he wants a recalibration, he will not touch the foundation of the U.S.-Philippine military alliance. Because the Philippine military has been largely trained, funded, oh, okay. not to mention much of intelligence in terms of counterterrorism and external threats. The Philippines relies on the Americans. So if Duterte cuts off that channel, he could risk a backlash from the military. And that's why Duterte has made it clear that his rhetoric is not necessarily an indication of policy, but the rhetoric is part of his own art of the deal posturing that will allow the Philippines to have negotiating uh, 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 leverage. Nonetheless, you can just do this for some time. If he keeps on 
flip-flopping, trying to play, at some point he's going to be played by the superpowers. So you can do it for a year probably, for one or two years. At some point the novelty will be gone. At some point others will read uh, your, your game and at some point maybe he's no longer as popular. So he cannot just keep going on doing what he's doing. Eventually he'll have to have more conventionality, more orthodox elements to his foreign policy. But at least at the starting point, he has reset the deck and given the Philippines more leverage to move forward. Has he, has he done it because of his genius or was it intentional? Not necessarily. Part of it was spontaneous, part of it was also that he's lucky. And now that in US you have Donald Trump, who doesn't seem to be a fan of human rights promotion abroad, he may find actually a modus vivendi with the US, and there's a high probability that at least on the level of executive to executive, there'll be a repair and reset of bilateral relations. But if Duterte continues his war on drugs in a scorched earth manner, the U.S. Congress and Senate will go after him. So it's also interesting to watch how Duterte will distinguish between the U.S. Congress and the U.S. government. Because in the case of EU, as I discussed with the European officials last year, it was that he cussed at the Ameri European uh, Union when in fact it was only the European Parliament which was criticizing him, not the European Commission. So there's also the element of him understanding also the domestic politics of other countries. For now, everyone is trying to understand him. And, and it's natural. I mean, he went from mayor to the president of a country in the middle of a geopolitical chessboard and a booming economy. That takes a lot of psychological leap and the learning curve should have been very steep. And he's not necessarily the youngest guy and yeah, quite a stubborn person. So for some time, people will give him some benefit of the doubt, including Filipinos and our international partners. But if he keeps on doing this for two years, three years, then the fundamental cost of that is this. Diplomacy is about strategic signaling and credibility matters. And if he keeps on flip-flopping in two, three years from now, the credibility of his signaling will be emaciated. And at that point in time, he may not be able to have much leverage in dealing with the superpowers. Maybe as, as president of ASEAN, he might learn a little bit of um, strategic, a little bit of um, uh, regional diplomacy. Um, on that note, we have to finish it up. But thanks very much. That was really interesting. My pleasure. Um, you know, the Philippines often gets left out. <laughs> and these sorts now of things. Too much in there. <laughs> now in they're they've they put themselves right front and center in through their in own reasons, things. but in, <laughs> <might as laughs> well, in yeah. their own region. So thank as, you very as, much as for coming to talk to us. Publicity is publicity. Yep.